In this video, I want to look at the consequences of the unique evolutionary explosion that gave us a threefold increase in human brain size in three million years. I argue that we are indeed an ill fitted species, blessed but also cursed with reflective consciousness, that we commit the greatest evil by trying to escape from evil, that our various escape strategies, excessive consumerism, terrorism, warfare, environmental destruction, all have roots in this and that despite the setbacks, we must push forward and establish reason as the path or we will fulfill the pessimist's claim that we are a temporary plague on the earth and destined for imminent extinction. The explosive rate of evolution necessary to triple our brain size in little over three million years from our hominid ancestors is unprecedented in evolutionary research. In an article appearing in the journal Cell in 2003, Bruce Lahn presents genetic evidence for this and concludes, quote, to have accomplished so much in so little evolutionary time is categorically different from the typical processes of acquiring new biological traits. This staggering rate requiring a major overhaul of the genetic blueprint suggests an intense selection process, unquote. This selection process, he suggests, is the result of greater cognitive abilities. As humans become more social, differences in intelligence will translate into much greater differences in fitness because you can manipulate your social structure to your advantage. Being a little smarter matters a lot. An important consequence of this is that the human brain is under great evolutionary pressure. Its most recent development, the cerebral or neocortex, the seat of higher order thinking, skills and speech, is not well integrated with the more primitive structures where more unconscious functions like instincts and emotions arise. This has been widely commented on by the likes of Carl Sagan, for example in his book Dragons of Eden. So this is the situation from the neuroscientific perspective. But how is this clash within our brains, the intentional versus the automatic, feel as a lived, embodied, subjective experience? Our lived reality is a mixture of anxiety or dread along with its complement, hope, joy and awe. The sense of dread, call it dukkha, existential angst, the fall, the shadow, it has many names. We find ourselves in a world where our vulnerability is never far from our minds, but vulnerable in a way unlike other animals who appear to live in a timeless now and respond largely unconsciously to the demands which life presents to them in the moment. Theirs is a relative Garden of Eden where instinct controls their behaviour. But it's no picnic, they are still in the life and death struggle for existence. But their brain has not multiplied their worries by adding a thinking module, an overheated, massive cerebral cortex, a second guesser. This is the organ that gives us the reality, or is it illusion, of free will. That serpent gift of self-awareness, whose price is our expulsion from the carefree dream time into a reality where awe, joy, love, hope, are blighted by anxiety and doubt. With this neocortex comes our creativity, our imagination, which we use to make the unreal real. We can just say no to reality and then conjure up an alternative reality to live in. Our massive neocortex has added an objective awareness of ourselves to the subjective experience of pre-human existence. But it is indeed a Faustian gift giving genius, hope and optimism to our species, but ripping at our soul, our sense of coherence, validity and safety. Mortality becomes the overriding and unsolvable problem of our lives, which adds to life its tone of tragedy, terror and despair. Over the millennia, many influential thinkers, social theorists, psychologists and philosophers, not to mention religious prophets, have come to some variant of this conclusion and some offer programs of relief. For example, from ancient traditions, we have Moses and later Muhammad teaching to seek solace in submission to the deity's will. Christ teaches to have faith in God's mercy. Socrates and Gautama both teach human empowerment through learning to see things without illusion. And in the 20th century, thinkers who analyze humans in terms of how we live in this reality, such as Freud, Jung and Adler, respectively see the pleasure principle, or the search for meaning, or the will to power, 
as the driving strategy. Others like Sartre see simple resignation to the fact that we are, quote, condemned to be free. One of the great thinkers who brought an interdisciplinary approach to the problems was social phenomenologist Ernest Becker. He argues that this overwhelming fear of death is repressed through symbolic systems of death denial. By this he means the ways we attempt to give consequence to our otherwise meaningless existence. In such books as the Pulitzer Prize winning Denial of Death, he develops this thesis as follows. Citing Kierkegaard, who says that thanks to our reflective consciousness, we humans know that we are here and thus we experience the emotions of both awe and dread. The dread because being here, we can conceptualize not being here. From Freud's discovery of unconscious repression, we see how the mind must deny our knowledge that we are animals without immortality in order for us to simply function, rather than cringe in the corner in fetal position or to reach for a valium the size of a Buick, as Sheldon Solomon puts it. We move past the paralyzing fear of our mortality by imagining and constructing a culture in which we have purpose and meaning and minimize the anxiety due to the unique human awareness of death. Culture provides us with social roles which define standards of acceptable conduct which allow us to perceive ourselves as persons of value in a world of meaning. We pay a high price for this denial strategy which Becker develops into a searing analysis of terror and evil. The problem is that, for me, my culture works as a symbolic immortality program by being right, so other belief systems must be fundamentally threatening to my very being. We see this in religion and politics, in ethnic and cultural intolerance, and even sometimes in antagonisms between subcultures or those who make different choices in life. Unconscious dread is never completely eliminated because death remains, and it is repressed and projected onto the other, the scapegoat, the outsider, who we either belittle, assimilate, or annihilate. By belittling, the threat of the other is disempowered. By assimilating, we convert them to our ideas, which are thus strengthened by social consensus. We must convert non-believers. By annihilating the other, we raise jihad or crusades against them. Ironically, in the name of these larger death-denying strategies, typically religions or nations, more people have died by far than by any other human behaviour. As never before, we have laid out before us the results of this escape from reality. In the face of death dread, we medicate ourselves with excessive consumerism and trigger collapsing economic orders. With rampant nationalism, we trigger wars around the world. With grabs for Earth's resources, we make the environment incompatible with our own survival. With tribal arrogance, we trigger social breakdown. And Becker's analysis should warn us how deep-seated lie the causes of these symptoms. So where does that leave us with our ill-fitting brain? There is no guarantee that it will all turn out okay. That we are not the greatest plague yet seen on Earth. The only way out of that destiny is by enough people ceasing to await divine rescue or indulging in other denial fantasies and see things as they are. Optimism and pessimism are equally paths to hell. Only hard-headed realism will suffice. We must make our lives fit the earthly environment which we have been cast into and stop trying to make it fit our programs of denial of reality. So what of the future? We are the barely conscious midwives at the birth of humanity's higher neocortical intelligence. If we manage to navigate this evolutionary bottleneck and harmonize our reflective consciousness, its glories and its curses, with the instinctual and emotional elements of our nature, then the promise intuited by so many teachers, thinkers and seers over the millennia will bear fruit. We now no longer are the helpless creatures of evolution but potentially agents in our own evolution, creators. Our pressing creative task is both collective and personal. Collective, by opening ourselves to love, we open ourselves to the angels of our better nature and gain the strength implicit in our reality as social beings. In the personal dimension, 
we must work to establish a harmony in our rapidly evolving minds. In this work, ignorance is the enemy, insight is the goal, and reason is the path.